So my name is Tom. i am uh, been doing using the Timberline system, which is now called Sage 300, for a little over 10 years. I used to work for a general contractor in California, and I've been doing consulting for the last six or seven years or so. So part of doing something like this is I need to ask you guys <coughs> what how you run your business now and what you're currently using in the software to figure out exactly what things we should all cover. So up on the screen right now is sort of the smorgasbord of things you can do in the Sage software for project management. We can also talk about the accounting functions um, and which ones you guys do and don't currently use, um, which can also help figure out exactly what we need to cover. So in terms of the basics of project management, um, document stuff, so the system can track RFIs, can track meeting minutes, can track drawing logs, can track submittal logs. So depending on whether you guys act as a general or not, you may or may not need some of those functions. I don't know if you guys want me to sort of go through everything and then we'll talk about what you might use or if you want to chime in um, as we go. About utilizing more than what we currently use. Sure. We have all okay. Okay, excellent. Um, then correspondence, there's an address book that's built into the system that you're already using, whether you realize it or not, for um, accounts payable and accounts receivable. And then you can also set it up for all your contacts within project management. So you can um, build a transmittal log. It has what's called a correspondence log. And right now, I'm just going to sort of buzz through everything, and then we'll go into the software and look at the different pieces. Uh, the correspondence log lets you log emails from Outlook. So when you get important emails on the job, you can copy them into project management which is nice when there's multiple people working on the same job or people in different sites working on jobs um, so that later when you go in you can see who got what email um, so scope changes or what have you um, one of the most powerful things is the change management system so tying in the project management process to the accounting process so being able to update your estimated costs, being able to update your contract schedule values to get ready for billing, and sort of tracking the what are all the requests that we've sent to our customer, which ones have they approved or not, and what things do we need to issue to our um, subs or vendors. And do you guys typically hire subs or you self-perform everything? Subs. Okay. Um, and then in terms of job setup, with the project management module, you do have the option of setting up jobs that are project management only and not accounting. And that can be useful if you um, want to track project documents during the bid phase. So if you have a lot of jobs where you're um, tracking drawings, tracking RFIs, before you win the job, you can set it up in project management to track all of those things, log the emails, do all of the non-accounting things without affecting the accounting side of the business. And then if you win the job, you can go ahead and, and switch it over to the accounting side as well. And then you already have whatever email history or document history set up. So for some companies, that's a really great thing to do. Other companies don't care. We would like <laughs> to know if we can act, like, kind of like you're saying, set up the job in project management and is there just a check mark that you check to make it turn into being in the accounting side of yes. it as well? Yes, although, and, and we'll go through the details of that, okay. but once you set up a job in the accounting system, you can never change the job number. Yep. The advantage of setting it up on the project management side is you can change the job number, but once you check the box to send it over to the accounting system, you can't change the number after that. So you probably want an accounting we person. Don't tend to change the job <laughs> numbers anyway once they're they're set, they're set, so. Okay, um, and some people use it like during bidding, they'll use the project manager's initials or the customer's initials. Okay. You know, that here are 10 bids, we might, we don't know which ones we're gonna get. We just open the job number whether we get it or not. Okay. So, Perfect. And we'd like to do that from project management and job cost if we can. 
Okay. Yep. Um, there is a field reports module, although it, um, I think it's hard to use, which is unfortunate because typically your field workforce is the least computer savvy. Um, so we can go through what that includes, but I wouldn't call that a strength of the system. Um, there's a whole bunch of customizations we can do. Um, to make forms look the way you want, um, to spit out some contracts straight out of the system so you don't have to do double entry. Um, and we don't necessarily need to get too far into that today, but we can talk about what's possible and see if there's things you guys want to follow up with. Um, and then in terms of the financials there, um, the project management module doesn't have its own financial tools, but it gives access to um, the accounting tools that are already in job costs. So um, you can control through security who can do what. So if you want to set up a workflow where the project manager um, uh, sets up a subcontract and then someone else reviews it and actually finalizes <coughs> it, um, you can do that. Or you can set it up so that everybody can do everything. Um, I am a big fan of avoiding double entry. So instead of somebody typing something up in Word and then handing it to somebody and saying, okay, now it's ready to go type it into the accounting system, I'm a big believer of whoever has the information, if they're going to type it somewhere, it type it into Timberline. And then if we need, need controls, we can add those controls. Um, and the same thing on the revenue side, you can um, set up a schedule of values. You can um, use security to have... Um, a project manager or a project accountant or however you guys do it, go in and fill out the billing form to say this is how much we're going to bill this month and either print it as a draft to give to your customer or have someone in accounting review it before you actually finalize that and send that over as an accounts receivable. Um, then there's other tools that are available. Um, My Assistant is the notification tool. so. Um, a lot of the things we'll see here as we go through it today, you can set up um, things with due dates. So an RFI might have a response date, an action item from a meeting might have a due date, um, you, a change order might have a quote you need from a sub with a due date. And there are reports you can run to find out what are the due dates and are they passed. Um, my assistant is the tool that will notify you without you having to go look. So you can set my assistant up to say, send me an email every day if there's RFIs due, or send me an email if my um, job goes over budget, or send me an email if my customer hasn't paid me in 60 days. So you, it's, um, it's a very flexible tool that um, if, you, if you're not already using it, it's something to consider to add that, that notification. Um, and, and these last things are all additional products that you may or may not choose to buy. So some of them are really cool, but you might not want to pay for them. Is my assistant something we have? Connector? Um, so Office Connector is the integration to Excel tool. <coughs> So Becky mentioned you guys. <laughs> you asked why would we want to. <laughs> right. Becky mentioned, oh, they want to get things in Excel. And I'm, well, my question is why? What numbers do we want in Excel and why do we want them in Excel? Because what are we going to do with them? And, and sometimes there's a good answer to that question. And other times it's, oh, just because I like Excel, which yeah. is the wrong answer. But <laughs> we're, we have you here so we can learn more about what the system can do for us. Right. OK. Um, and then Address Explorer is a tool that lets you um, import and export contacts from Outlook into the Timberline address book or Timberline into Outlook. Um, so what I usually recommend is um, set it up to export from Timberline to Outlook and then have everybody manage your contacts inside of Timberline and then you can have a shared contact folder. Um, on your Exchange server that everybody can copy those contacts. Because um, if you set up the contact in Outlook first, then you're not going to want to set it up in Timberline because you've already typed all that stuff in once and 
you're not going to want to type it in a second time and then you're the only one who has that information and it's not available in the system. Um, so it sounds like we kind of want to go through a little bit of everything. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, for me and what I definitely want to learn more about is like your change management, um, purchase order entry, estimates, cost management for entering estimates. Um, I need to know step by step then how to set up jobs from project management um, to where we don't have to go um, on another sign in job cost and make that be a permanent job. Okay. Um, and is, is everybody all in for everything? I think we should. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and this, I just switched over to a different presentation I gave at the user conference last week, which was even more of an introductory thing uh, to talk about all the different modules. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just sort of looking to see if any of this is relevant. So you guys already are set up on the accounting side. Um, and so today we're talking about the project management module. And you'll hear me call it PJ. Every module has a two-letter initial, and even though everyone calls a project manager a PM, so why is that? Timberline built the property management module first, oh, and they used the initials PM. And then when they got around to writing the project management module, they realized the initials mm -hmm. PM were already used. So I guess they took the J out of project to make it PJ. So mm -hmm. folks who have been using it for a long time just, just say why. PJ, 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 and don't even think about it anymore. And folks who are new wonder what the heck are you talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, so we can skip most of that stuff, I think. So the interface I am a big fan of is the Sage desktop. So this gives you access to all your modules as well as a reporting homepage. So this is set up to show a list of open jobs grouped by project manager. Um, and I think this is especially good for folks who are not familiar with the system. So instead of opening up a big blank screen, which I'll do right now, if I open up the PJ module to go into project management, We used to call it the gray screen of death because it used to be gray, but now it's white with little sage flowers on it. Still gray. <laughs> Brian. <laughs> I don't work in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, so you guys are on version 9.8 then. You're right. Mm -hmm. When you upgrade, you'll get this pretty background. <laughs> background. But for a project manager or someone who's not, who doesn't use the system all the time, saying, okay, you're now in the project management system, congratulations. That's not real helpful that you're looking at a big empty screen. Um, so the Sage desktop interface does two things for you. And I love the interface, I hate the name because saying Sage desktop versus your Windows desktop gets really confusing. Um, but, oh well, we have to deal with it. So the two things are it gives you shortcuts to tasks so instead of looking at that big blank screen, you can say, oh, I'm working on job setup. What are the tasks that might be involved? Oh, I need to set up the job. I need to enter my estimate. I need to set up my subcontracts and purchase orders. I need to enter my contract. Can we that have this desktop view with the 9.8 then? Yes. Okay. Um, and so um, I can give you one similar to what I have here, and then we can talk about customizing further from there. Okay. Um, so again, instead of looking at that blank screen and saying, I don't know where to go, you can say, well, I'm, you know, if I'm working on change orders, am I sending a change, am I putting together a change request? Did I receive a change order from my customer? Am I gonna issue a commitment change order to my sub or my vendor? Again, it sort of 
lets you put the reports and the data entry screens in a, in a more user-friendly way. And then on the, re the reporting side, it lets, lets you say, even if you're not familiar with navigating the accounting system, you can pick a job that you're working on and double click on the job to drill down to get more information. And it's usually not this slow. And so you can drill down onto a job to see um, the overview information for that job. So here's my estimate, here's my current costs, here's all my documents, here's who's working on the project, here's my billing. Um, and then you also have access to drill down reports of, oh, well, hey, I need to work on RFIs. I can click on RFI log and it knows what job number I was working on. So it shows me the RFI log for that <laughs> particular job. Well, it's going to show you what's in your system, so yeah. the computer doesn't know what about the pieces of paper on your desk if you choose not to tell the computer about them. <laughs> and there's nothing anybody can do about that. <laughs> no, hire more people to do injury. <laughs> That's really neat. So the cost control, all those estimates can be entered from DJ. Yes, and um, it's no different then entering it through job cost. So if you're already doing enter estimate in job costs, it looks exactly the same from PJ. And that's what you tried to give me access to was to enter in job costs, correct? Mm -hmm. And I couldn't. I don't know why, but, but we would also, there's gonna be certain um, locations that only have access to PJ. So we wanna try to utilize PJ as much as possible. Okay. Perfect. So, yeah, I just want to be clear because some people, when they say enter it in PJ, think it means something different. If, From a licensing perspective, yes, we can use the PJ module to enter information that will end up in job cost. Mm -hmm. um, so, from PJ, if we go to the contract control menu, that's the enter estimate screen. Right. Um, and if you've seen it in job cost, it looks exactly the same. Uh, but you can enter each line item. What's the cost code? Is it okay. some contract material equipment? Um, what's the amount? And just go through and enter the estimate. And then that um, estimate ends up in the system that through change management, you can do approve changes to your estimate so How that, that you would put it there. You have from that other screen. From the other screen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's how it gets under the original estimate. And are you guys you guys you guys are doing that now? We have do that. Haven't started doing it. Right. Okay. And we do what just a overall original estimate by project if it was a two hundred thousand dollar project and that that's to the extent of it, but we want to drill down deeper into those individual cost code levels. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you, we can enter one right now if you guys want to go see the details of what it looks like. Um, we should probably take a step back and start by setting up a job, sure. but that's um, entering the estimate would be one of the first things we do next. Yeah. Um, and I was just saying to sort of walk through this report that you can enter changes to your estimate as part of the change management system so that when you propose um, a change order to your customer, you can track both what you think it'll cost you and what you want to charge your customer. So you can figure in your profit as part of that change proposal. Um, so in the, in the system by default, it's called a change request. Some people call it a PCO, a potential change order. Some people call it a change order request. Whatever it is where you're putting together some people call it a change issue. Um, 
you know, here's what it'll cost me, here's what I want to charge, send it to your customer, hey, do you approve this scope of work? Um, so that's an important piece of doing this all well, because some companies, when they approve change orders, they document the extra revenue, but they don't document the extra cost. So on your cost report, every single line item is over because the scope has changed and the work you're doing no longer matches your original estimate because you're doing a different scope of work. Um, so what you really want to do is, as part of each change, document the changes to your estimated costs as well as the changes to your revenue. So that way you can see which line items are truly over budget or under budget um, to manage your costs. Um, in the system, the word commitment refers to either a purchase order or a subcontract. Um, and so that is documenting when you've issued a purchase order or a subcontract, you have committed those dollars. So if you said it's going to cost me $10,000 to do this um, in this particular cost code, once you've written a subcontract for $8,000, um, from an accounting perspective, your costs are still zero because until the sub invoices you, the accounting side doesn't recognize anything. But as a project manager, the fact that the job today cost is zero, you still don't get to spend all $10,000. You only have 2000 left to spend because you've spent the first eight by issuing that subcontract. So the commitment will document those purchase orders and subcontracts. Um, so that you can track, so job to date costs is an accounting term. Right. So job to date costs represents um, invoices you've received plus money you've, checks you've written. So whether that's payroll or invoices or um, payments it's costs recognized by the accounting folks. Allocated is for the operations folks of, from my original estimate, how much of that money have I spent? Including your uh, commitments. So it includes yes. the commitments. And that's what, I, that's, that's, what, that's what we care about. She cares about right. the other. Right, exactly. <laughs> no, I don't actually. I care That's about the whole thing. <laughs> right. I try to help watch the numbers too. <laughs> right. So a lot of the accounting reports say, well, what's your actual cost, which as a project manager, that might be an interesting number, but it's not the most important number. Um, so like this report will show you your remaining of your allocated compared to your revised estimate. You know, so in this case, um, <laughs> our actual cost so far is 366, but we have commitments hanging out there that haven't invoiced us yet to, that gets our total allocated up to 374 compared to our estimated 354. So as a project manager, I need to know I'm 20,000 over budget, even though the accounting folks don't know it yet because all the invoices haven't hit. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the good news and the bad news of the system is everything is customizable. Um, so the good news is we can make the reports look like whatever we want. The bad news is the whatever report you find might not be the showing you what you need to see. So um, that's part of the, the setup is figuring out based on how you're running your business, which are the reports you need to see and are there columns. You know, this report has 80% of what I want, but I want to add one more column or this is showing me detail I don't need to see. Let's take that out. And I have this um, set up so that when you're on a normal laptop or a um, widescreen monitor that this will basically fill the page, which it's not working with the projector right now. But um, And then obviously you can print it out if you need to print it out. Um, okay, so back to workflow. Uh, 
Um, so let's start with, um, should we just walk through the whole process of mm -hmm. setting up a job, entering an estimate, creating some, some contracts? A to Z, maybe. Mm -hmm. All right. So from the project management side, we can go to set up job. and it will open up our job setup screen. So you can get to the same screen if you're in desktop, going to the shortcut, setup job in PJ. Oh, it, it won't let me open it two different ways. So from desktop, I can say I want to set up a job in PJ. It will open up that exact same data entry screen So throughout all the PJ data entry screens, there's a row of buttons over on the right-hand side. So you can create a new thing. Since we're in job setup, if we say new, it'll be a new job. If you're in RFI, pressing new will create a new RFI. You can press find to see what's already out there. Um, and in this case, it's a list of jobs. There's a previous and a next, so you can sort of scroll through. You know, so that as you're looking at your change order requests or as you're looking at your RFIs, it's all sort of the same navigation over here. When you first open that up and it's blank like this, you don't have to press new, do you? No, it's okay. it's as if you had just hit okay. new, yes. It's, it's ready to enter a new one. So in most cases, when you open up a screen, it assumes you're creating something new and it's um, it's as if you just hit the new button. So if you're not creating something new and instead want to open up something you've already created to edit it, then you would press the Find button to go find what's out there. And I'm going to press Find because I don't know exactly what job numbers are in here. So let's do 14014. So just like setting up in job costs, you enter the next job number you want to use, enter the job name. Um, and if that job has already been created in job cost, it's automatically set up in project management. Right. Um, and if you are creating in a project management and want it to be created in job cost, if you have the security access to, to get into job costs, you'll have this checkbox. And if you don't, you won't. And so you can check that box to say, yes, I want to create this job not only on the project management side, but also on the job cost side. And in order to create it on the job cost side, you need some accounting information. So it will pop up this additional screen. Um, one of the important things is billing method. Um, so if you're using the contracts module, you can set this to default to contracts. Because if you don't have it set to default to contracts, it will default to quick bill, which then locks you out of using contracts. But we use quick bill, correct, Brian? Correct. Okay. We have, we have contract modules and we have So what I recommend is set it to default to use contracts, set your billing module to allow quick bill, but then that way you're not locked out because if you say you're not using contracts yet, you're never going to be able to as long as you have this set to use quick bill because the day you want to try, it, you'll be locked out. So if you're not ready to start using contracts, that's fine, but we should still set it up so that you have that option when you are ready. And then most most companies put the project manager name here. Um, okay. Um, and then some, depending on how your accounting side is yep. set up, it may require a GL prefix for the general ledger. <coughs> and 
This is all typically stuff that project managers don't know about, which is why it's on the job cost side of the setup. <laughs> um, so you can do it where the project manager enters the job number and doesn't check the box if you don't, if you don't have that information or don't want to deal with it. You can still enter the job site address. You can start to build the job contact list. Um, we can also set up custom fields. So I've set up some custom fields here um, so that if you are using the system to track jobs that you're bidding, you can do things like what's the bid date, who's bidding it. Um, and again, all of this is sort of optional depending on what information you want later. You know, so if a year from now you want to be able to say how many jobs did we bid and what percent did we win, well then you need to put, put that information somewhere that you can do that calculation later. Um, and if all the jobs you won are already in Timberline, then my answer is, well, let's put all the jobs we lose in there too. And the best way to do that is put them in while we're still bidding them when we don't know if we've won or lost. That's why we put all, that's why we do a job number for everything, correct? Yeah, from the get-go, whether we get it or not. Yeah, so you can add custom fields to categorize things if you want to say, you know, do we win or lose more? Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, I don't know your business well enough to know what your major categories of jobs are, but, um, you know, if you want to look at energy companies versus other kinds of companies, you can set up a pull down to say it's this kind of job and then have a report at the end of the year that says, you know, for energy, we won this percent of our bids and for this, we won that percent. <coughs> And again, none of that is required, but it's, it's all stuff that if you know what you want out of your system. So you need to think about what are the list of three or eight or 10 or 20 things we want and what order do we want them in. It's not that it's impossible to change, but it is very difficult to change after the fact. And if you've created something that's a date, you can't later say, oh, I don't want that to be a date. I want it to be just text or I can type something in. Too late. <laughs> so it's a very powerful way to customize it. But I Not recommend just starting to throw stuff in there. Yeah. Spend some time thinking about what you, where you want it to end up before you start throwing stuff in there. You know, and I usually do it sort of in a flow of if you want to track jobs while you're bidding them, have here's the field related to while we're bidding. If you have a pre-construction phase, here are the things we might want to track during pre-construction. Here are the things we want to track during construction. If you have special warranty stuff, here's the stuff we want to track for closeout or warranty. You know, so it, it, it's kind of easier to fill this out if you have it grouped by the phase of the project. Um, and again, you, it's, it's all creating places to enter stuff so that later you can do reports. Um, no. By checking this box, this gives you all of the stuff that's required. So if you want to edit what's in job cost, yes, you would do it from job cost. But once you've entered this information, you've done everything that's required to set the job up in job cost. It just doesn't have the workers comp no. information mm -hmm. here. It doesn't have the payroll level. Which in job cost is under scope PR and EQ. Can you set that up when it's since it's not an option here, we would still have to go to job cost. Yes. Okay. That was what we needed to know.
And so I just went over to job costs and typed in that same number. And it's telling me, I see you're entering a number that you've already started to create. Are you pulling it into job costs? And so if you were using temporary numbers, this is the, ch the point where you have a chance to change the number. Um, it sounds like that doesn't apply to you guys. You're going to have permanent numbers. But yeah, if you wanted to change the payroll, you would have to do that here from job cost. Um, let me go back to that job. If you had saved this job here when you went over to job cost, would it have still asked you if you wanted to? Did, did you save this one? I saved it in project management. I saved it with the checkbox not checked. Okay. That's why it asked that. Yes. Okay. So if I check the box yep. and set it up, and save that, then if I open up the job and job cost, it's just going to be a job just, just like, it. yeah, okay. it's just there. And if I create a new job and job costs, that doesn't give me a choice. Jobs and job costs always get created in project management, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so, um, in project management, there's a, a lot of information that also shows up in job costs. So the job site address, for example. Okay, and then this is the one that you set up in job costs. Now you're adding information to it in the project management? Yes. Module. Okay. So I can enter job site information in project management, and I'm switching to a different job because it won't let me have the same job open in both just so we can see. That if I open, then open that job and job cost, now the job site information is there. Okay. So regardless of whether it gets entered from job costs or entered from project management, um, there's certain information that's shared. There's certain other information like payroll, like accounts payable, that is specific to job costs. And then there's other information like the job contact list that is specific to project management. So I can say I'm the project manager, Ace Drywall is one of my subcontractors, John Allen is my customer. Um, so from what I'm doing here is uh, the pull down list shows an alphabetical list from your address book, which usually gets too big to do that. So if you do the binoculars, it will open up a list. So it's, you can see either a list of companies that you have in your Timberline address book or a list of persons. It also lets you show companies and persons mixed together, which I usually prefer not to do that because I think it gets confusing. Um, so after people and companies are set up in the address book, you can then pick them and add them to the list. So one thing about this desktop report is it's not updating live. Um, so this was actually hasn't been updated actually since Monday. So if I hit my house icon for my home page, it will reload my home page, which will now include that new job that I just set up, or both of those new jobs that I set up. And then you said that same page report can be been filtered to just one project manager when he's opening his, he's just saying his job. 
we can set it up with security so that if I'm logged in, I see my list of jobs and I don't see anybody else's jobs. So you're not you're not well, locked not, out. We have so many jobs, you wouldn't want to see everybody's jobs. That's what I'm saying, that's awesome. I mean, you take and get his, I can get right. my, well, he gets everybody. But <laughs> I can get mine, Andrew can get his right. or whatever. I don't need to see everybody else. Yeah. All of that, uh, we can see everything from Mississippi. You have to let security issues, or is it just a genetic project manager from just handling jobs, or Um. It is possible to do it th literally through security. That usually slows your system down to set up task-based, not task-based, to set up file-based security. Um, what I'm doing is this report knows the login of who's logged in and what their name is. And I just say, whosever name is logged in, only show me the jobs that have that name. So that means if you spell their name differently, in the project manager box than you do in security, then they're not going to see the job. Sure. But it's a quick and easy way to do it that doesn't actually you require, doesn't actually lock people out of anything. It just guides you to where um, you, you should you be. Right. Did I enter this on the other job? I'm trying to find the, I didn't enter a project manager name when I set up those jobs. <coughs> oh, and I picked people that don't have addresses entered in address book. <laughs> Where would the address be? In address book. There. So the point I was going to make is that you pick contacts out of the system and you have separately entered what's their email address, what's their phone number, what's their address, and then that just prints on the list. The point I ended up making is if you don't enter your information, it's not going to print out on your report. So my job contact list doesn't have anyone's address because I didn't enter those addresses into address book. So I can go to my set up a person and I can go find myself for example and I can see that my address is blank so I can add my address and we need John Allen from Morrison Concrete Yeah, so I'm typing in John to get to the Johns and then find looking for John Allen. And you should decide that you're either going to enter everybody last name first <laughs> or first name first because it looks like I have some Johns entered under John and I have him entered under A for Allen. Right. <laughs> so if I have properly set up my contacts, then by adding the contacts to my job, I would then have their information on my job contact list. So I have to refresh my home page because I now have new data that I just entered in the system. Then I can open up that job. And now when I go to my job contact list, I have addresses. So again, your reports can only ever be as good as the data you have in your system. The system doesn't know about the things you don't tell it about.
Um, so there's a couple other things we we do in um, the job setup screen. You have the option of setting up a spec section list, um, and then that would create a pull down for that job. Um, so that when you're in the RFI screen or the submittal screen, you can have a pull down of here's the spec sections we're using on this particular project. Um, and it's sort of six of one, half a dozen of the other. Some people really like that. Other people don't want to take the time to do the setup ahead of time. And you can just hand key in the spec section numbers um, when you get to the other screens later. Um, you can set up a couple defaults. So if you're doing RFIs, you can specify a number of days to respond so that the due date will automatically be filled out. You can specify who on the job is going to receive all the RFIs so they'll be pre-addressed. Um, same thing, you can set who receives submittals. Um, and then change order management, we'll get into a little more detail later. You can spe um, set up your markups ahead of time. So um, what your overhead and profit is, if you have a different percentage on some contracts than you do on labor, if you're doing insurance and bond, you can make it as simple or as complicated as you need it to be. So if when you do a change order, if you say, here's what it's going to cost us and here's our overhead and profit, you can just add a single markup line. Well, if we yeah. just, uh, on project management side, we put in the total. You have control over that. So during job setup, you can specify here's, here's how much markup we're allowed on this job. So it will automatically add the markup. Or you can leave it blank. And then each time you send a request, you can manually adjust the markup. Or manually adjust the price so that it in includes a markup, but it's not shown as a here's the base price, here's the markup, here's what I'm charging you. You can just show it to your customer as Here's the price. So you have that flexibility. OK, so that's um, setting up the job. So there's a lot of places in Timberline where there's extra fields. So like there's a text field here for type of job. Um, there's a text, you know, job size if you want to do square footage. And I just kind of skipped past all of those, that those aren't required. Um, they're available. Um, I personally prefer using the custom fields tab because you can set up pull downs. You know, these fields are just text boxes. So it's kind of hard to do a report at the end of the year because I can guarantee that not everyone is going to spell everything exactly the same with the same spaces and the same periods. And um, so. I kind of. Well, yeah, because then if you yeah, put a maintenance, then it's never going to get misspelled and right. abbreviated or anything right. like I'm that. Right. misspell it every time. <laughs> <laughs> a a yeah. different way every Two time. Of them never <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Three stuck in this sit. <laughs> All right, so typically the next step after setting up a job would be entering your estimate. And so in this grid, we would enter our job number. The system has what by default it calls extras, which a lot of people call sub jobs, um, which are not required. OK, all right. So um, if, if you have them set up, so if you're, do you use them as part of the original estimate or you set them up to track additional scope after the job's underway? It's kind of both. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is something that is not available to set up through a project management license. It has to be set up through a job cost license. Right. And so if you need extras to be set up as part of your original estimate, 
somebody's going to have to go into job cost and set up the extras. And do you guys typically do it for like phases over time or for different areas of the project? Different areas of the project. Okay. For us up here. Um, but we use it too as a change order. As a change order for, level too. Yeah. Above and beyond our original scope. But with the change order tabs, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, we wouldn't use it here anymore, right? Well, if you create a change no. order, you're still going to have to sign up an extra. An extra job number. It'll just be your main job member with the dash 100 or. But we do in the same scenario. If we got his main job, and we do this position here, and if we do permutation here, we do it that way. Okay. Yeah, so when we go to create the change order request, you would then say all of my costs for this change order request are going to go to extra number 100. So that. Um, and you typically do the work and then you look and see what how much you spent and you that's how you know what to charge your customer or you right. do an estimate ahead of time. That's all I can. Okay. Depends on the contract. Like GM contract or if you want. Okay. Okay. So I just set up extra 01 is the north, extra 02 is the east. So then once those are set up in your grid, you can call up the list as you're entering the original estimate. So um, in all of these screens where you're accessing the accounting system, there's typically a, a button that says lists in the F four key on the keyboard does the same thing. So in the cost code column, if you're wondering, well, what are my choices? You can press F4, press list, and it'll say, here's all the cost codes. Um, and, and my system here is kind of a generic system with a little bit of everything, general contractor level codes and the, the old five digit CSI codes. I don't know if you guys are using the five digit or the newer six digit and it doesn't really matter yeah, you can just yeah some are threes and some are fives okay so. and again it doesn't matter what set of codes you're using just that you're consistent that mm -hmm. you track your estimate against your subcontract against your actual costs and you know that you're if everything lines up, then your job cost reporting will work. And you can say, for this trade, what, are, what did I think I was going to spend? What did I actually spend? Um, and then category, similar that you can press the list button. Um, and in a lot of these screens, it'll show you sort of a filtered list. And you can press the view button and switch to the full list. Um, you know, so if it's a cost code that you normally only do labor on, but this time you're renting equipment, if, if you need to get that full list and say, oh, this is E for equipment instead of L for labor, you can get to that. You know, or if it's S for sub. And then you have the option of tracking units if it's a unit cost based thing, or you can just enter dollar amount. And so as I'm hitting the tab key, it's copying whatever I had entered before. So it only works if you're paying your AT and your labor to these cost codes, correct? Yeah. And you say, in a sense, we're not tagging them. We set this all on estimates. So all of a sudden, people are out in the field where sometimes you've got tags of the wrong cost code. So there's still a ghost tool in that report, but it's not going to show you against that. Correct. Cost code, because you're going to have a cost code estimate up here, and then you're going to have actual cost for different cost codes down here, correct? Yep. So, so you're going to need to know for each job what cost codes are going to be using for those cost codes. Is that correct? Is that a correct statement? So you're, 
getting at like labor, we use basically two cost codes, a superintendent and a journeyman, right? Well, correct. We just make sure that when we set up a job and answer it, but that you, everybody's going to have to be aware of the cost codes that we're using for that job. It could be different on these different jobs. So you can use labor and power inclusive, right? Not by that. Well, we have cost codes for superintendent. Right. That's what I'm saying. So you don't must have to enter your right. estimate for a superintendent how much you right. expect him to have on the job versus your journey. Or if you get out of the 15 or 30, which is the industrial end, out right. of cost code, all our labor is going to go to 15 or 30. So when it gets processed as payroll, it doesn't Everybody matter has if they're a superintendent, that if they're a uh, uh, right. right. It just, we need to make sure that we're mm -hmm. all synced in the, in the beginning. So that mm -hmm. we're doing even like AP, if we're at tagging the materials or something, would we tag that to a different cost code than that? So when we run these estimates... The most important thing is coding things correctly. Um, and I don't care if you use 30 codes on your job or three codes on your job. I'd rather have you use three codes and code everything correctly mm -hmm. than use 30 codes and have nothing line up because right. that just makes it more confusing. Yeah. So, you know, Yes, if you want to break out your superintendent labor versus your project management labor versus your field labor. We have to do that if they're billed at different rates, so because we have to track them separately. Yeah. Um, and the reports will also sort of roll things up by division. So if you have a prefix and then a follow-on code, you know, so it is possible to put, if you're charging to 15.123 and 15.124 and 15.125, you can put all your estimate in 15100 and then your costs are hitting in 15123 15124 15125 and then you can look up at the division 15 level to say here's what my estimate was here's what you know total estimate total cost but as a project manager we can just put the lump sum in under the category and then as they enter the data it'll break it down who who worked what hour or how much potentially yes okay. so that so these bold lines here are at the division level. You know, so here are each of my finish codes. Under this first code, 9210, my estimate was zero, but, I, but then I issued a purchase order for 1500. So this is just bad project management right here. Of <laughs> <laughs> Don't issue a purchase order under a cost code where you said you were going to spend zero. Um, but the type of thing we're talking about it could still hit as a cost in a in a code other than where you entered it um, but as long as they have both have the same prefix then that summary line it'll balance out or should balance out okay. yeah, that, I mean, when we did it, we can split out all those costs right all, all the co I mean superintendent German well make Germans have five well well, if you put your estimate for labor under general conditions and put it on Division 1, but then in payroll you charge it to Division 15 because you're doing mechanical work, that's, that's not helping anybody that you have estimate up in Division 1 and costs down in Division 15. No one's going to know that those are supposed to tie out to each other. So if you have estimate in Division 15 under one code, but the costs are hitting in a different code, Yes, one line will say I estimated dollars and have zero spent. I didn't estimate, but I do have uh -huh. dollars spent. But at the division level, it'll tie out. It'll tie out at the division level. So we still want to make sure it costs within that book. When we go down the second level. Yeah. So we'll Yeah, so the. The trick is decide how you want to code things and then code them that way. And code them the same way up front as you're going to code them in the field. Okay. So as I'm tabbing through, if my next line is not part of extra one, I can go back to my list to change it. Or I can just hit the delete key if it's not part of an extra. And if I want to use a different code, I can switch codes. Mm -hmm. 
then after you've entered your line items, there's a button there that says total, so you can see um, total labor, total subcontract, total equipment, job total. Um, if you've done units, it, it'll show your total units that you've entered. So you can sort of double check that do all these line items total up to what I'm trying to enter. There is a button called finalize um, and that basically locks the estimate. So you probably don't want to necessarily push that right away. Um, but in general it's a it's Yes. So I can finish this, and um, when you enter things on the accounting side, it wants to create a journal, so it will pop up a little screen here. Oh, it didn't. I just went to do it. Um, so it entered those estimated values, and I did not finalize the estimate, so it's not locked. So now on my demo job, I have an estimate of 44.56, which is showing in red on this report because it exceeds my contract value because I haven't entered my contract yet. Okay. So then I can go into my report to say, here is my job cost report before any of the costs have hit of here's, here's my estimate of where I expect to spend the dollars. You know, so you might want to have some version of this report to have in the field of these are the codes we expect to use on this job. Um, and then if that's correct, it's it's still not required, but it's a good practice to then press that finalize button, which then locks the original estimate so that once you start, then anything else has to be done as a change. Um, and in the um, project management change management system, it is possible to do um, internal changes. So like if stuff does get coded wrong, you can move dollars from one estimate line item to a different estimate line item. Um, it of course is easier to code things correctly in the first place, um, but if you need, do need to move things around, um, or I like to use that for if a line item goes over, you know, if something busts, how am I going to make it up? You know, my concrete went over, well, I can make it up with my electrical. Well, then I'm actually going to move those dollars so that I know, you know, instead of saying I'm going to leave that as over budget and I'm going to try and make this one under budget by the same amount, I'll just move my budget up as an internal change to say this is, this is my new estimate that I'm tracking to. Yeah, there you go through the internal changes. No, I do an internal change order to my estimate. So it's an... It's an internal change that doesn't affect my customer, doesn't affect the price of the project, but it allows me to have approved changes to my estimate. Because um, I'm just a big believer in not having your costs exceed your estimate. Because um, once you get in the habit of saying, oh yeah, that line item's over budget, you're in trouble. Because three months later, it's going to be even worse. Yeah, you know. I like to balance my out. Yeah. And as you're juggling things, it helps you keep track of where you said you were going to put them so you don't so you don't spend that same money twice to cover yourself. Swag is juggling before you get to what I'm saying. Well that's what I do in my report. I get them, I'll have her move this to here and that. Well, you just would do an internal change order to get from one, to get that line item. 
Right. So it says it would be a zero price change order because you're not affecting your contract value. And typically it would be a zero cost change order because I'm not changing my total estimate. I'm adding dollars to one line item and taking those same dollars away from a different line item. Um, and why don't we do that since we're talking about it? Don't you have a lot of new ideas? Right, and this is, this is the point where I tell the accounting people, don't, you want your project manager stuff to be in the system, so. Oh, I haven't, we haven't finished setting up the job yet, so it's not gonna let me do a change order because this job doesn't have a contract yet. Um. So there's another tool inside of um, desktop called Job Central, which is kind of the all-in-one setup screen. And it's actually the easiest way to set up a contract. So I'm going to do that real quick just to put in a contract amount for this job. Um, so it starts by the same similar looking setup screen of setting it up in job cost. You can do the address. You can um, set up the accounting stuff, the payroll things we talked about. You can set up the billing of who your customer is. Um, what retention your customer's going to hold, what invoice format you want it to print on. And if you do it all at once, it will pre-assign the contract number to match the job number. And then you can set up your schedule values. And the nice thing about this is you can cut and paste from Excel. so that if you have um, sorry I can't type and talk at the same time so if you have a schedule of values from a previous job already set up you can ju um, just cut and paste it which um, especially if your customer has a lot of line items that they want you to invoice against then you don't have to enter those all you can have those in Excel and cut and paste Okay. Yep. So yeah, and if you're going to a commercial project and you have your I guess uh, uh, I'm guessing uh, all general conditions type work. Yeah. And in general the Setting up the contract is however your customer wants to see the invoices you send to your customer. So when, we, when you set up the estimate, it's whatever codes you want to track against for your costs. You can, you can have as many or as few as you want. When you set up your contract, it's as many line items as your customer wants. So if it's a T&M single line item, you set it up as a single line item. If it's if you're doing work in five different areas and they want you to invoice you, want you to invoice them against those five different areas, then you would set up those five as the line items. But even being in, you divide it between labor and material, equipment. Well, on the, you can. So if it's tracking your costs, you would set up your estimate to track labor. Here's how much I'm going to do on labor. Here's how much I'm going to do on material. When it's invoicing your customer, if they want to see you know, I want an invoice that has a line item for material and a line item for equipment. You can have two line items there. Yeah. Most of them that we work with don't see that. Yeah, okay. Most at least the three breakdowns. Equipment, material, and labor. Subs and consumables. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, and I guess if it's all TNM, you won't necessarily be setting it up as a contract at a time because it won't be a fixed value. So, so yeah, we'll, I mean, we'll have the fixed value before. I, I know down south we'll have the fixed value before we start even if it's TNM. Yeah, and there's okay. a lot of TNM not for speed. Okay. So, uh, I mean, everything we do down there will be TNM not for speed. So okay. Yeah, I'm trying to catch yeah. up here. We're entering schedule. No. Nope. <laughs> you, you yeah. snooze, you lose. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you step back, I'll leave. Because this is, we have this contract module. Okay. And remember when you say on our reports and we get that contract and all that we fill in there? This is how we would set it up. Okay. So another tool inside of the Sage desktop is something called Job Central. How do you set that up? Especially if you're sharing licenses, um, all the stuff you do in this homepage dashboard is not using a paid license. So as you're drilling down into these reports, you're not using a job cost license, you're not using a PJ license, you're not using an AP license. Okay. Even though you're getting information coming out of those modules. It's kind of like an inquiry then. Right. And you're also not using your information assistant license. You're just using desktop, which you have. I mean, it's obviously not free because you've paid for your system. Um, but you can have unlimited installs of desktop. So every user can be in desktop running reports as long as it's in this home page preview pane mm -hmm. without paying anything. It's only when you go into a data entry screen or pick a particular report that you want to run um, that it will then use the license. And just to go back to the Excel thing, if, <coughs> if the reason you want Excel is so you can look at hours spent and when you're going to run out, my response to that is why don't we build that into your homepage so that That's it's, so it's there it. every time you log in. If you can do that, that would be... If all you're going to do is pull the numbers in so that you can run the same formula, let's put the formula in this report so it says, you know... This job had 150 hours. You've spent 60 so far. You have 90 left to go. You know. I want to take into consideration the composite rate that you're running on the job. Can you set it up to do that? Well, we can set it up to do anything. <laughs> Is the good news and the bad news. <laughs> well, um, they care about what it's going to cost to do it. <laughs> right. That's why I was thinking of what you're looking for in investing and setting it up. You right. just push one button. You don't have to worry about bringing in. Yeah, because I mean, if we do it all right here, I'm. I think we're all happy. Let's pipe. Because I'm with him, doing it twice. Right. Well, I, I, I don't want to do it twice. No. So. Um, for something like that, we'd probably need to create a custom field um, tied to the cost code. So that you could say, on this job, in this cost code, here's our burn rate. And then we could say, here's how many hours you estimated, here's how many of you spent, here's how many you have left, and you've said what your burn rate is, I can tell you how many days left you have. You know, or whatever, you know, however it is you're calculating that formula now, mm -hmm. we can say what are the, the pieces of information that go into it um, and make sure they're in the system. Um, and when you enter the estimate, you're going to say for this cost code, you know, here's how many labor hours and here's how many dollars I need, um, which won't necessarily tell you your rate, but then we can cre custom. create a custom field so that you can either track dates or rate or however it is you want to track it. Do everything on Just it'll do everything. Right. It's just setting it up to do what we want it to do. And 
Yeah. yeah. That way everything's in there and everybody can pull it up and everybody can look at everything. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, then you ain't got to worry about getting reports down south, up north. Right. Right. Up north, if they do something up here to the job, she'll see it right away. Right. I'd rather do everything. And it keeps me out of trouble with the, the fan. <laughs> is all good. Just got another box. Really good. Yep. All right. So, um, because Angie left the room, we started talking about different stuff. So we were talking about um, coding and entering estimates. And um, so we, had, we entered the estimate, we pulled up the job cost report to show, okay, we just did enter estimate, and now we see the dollars in the estimate column, but we don't have any actual costs yet because we haven't done any work yet. Um, and then we started talking about managing the cost report and doing internal change orders to move dollars from one line item to another. Okay. So that if either stuff does get coded wrong, um, and or if we have a bust or a buyout that we can take dollars from one line item in our estimate and move them to a different line item. Okay. So we're going to say, since we're talking about it, even though we said we're going to do change management later, let's jump in there. But we couldn't do a change order because we hadn't yet set up a contract and it won't let you do change orders until you finish setting up the job. So then we went in to quickly set up a contract. <laughs> And then we stopped midstream and my laptop crashed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Um, and because I didn't want to scare these guys, I didn't actually go into the contracts module, um, which is sort of more difficult data entry than it's always worth. Instead, I went in through the Job Central interface, which yeah. is another tool that is available in desktop. Actually, you go into the billing module to do billings. The contract module is to set up. Uh, you can if you choose to. Using Quick Bill doesn't provide the same level of tracking. So once you start using contracts, you typically don't want to mix and match, but you can Quick Bill if you choose to. Um, because once you use contracts, you will then have the tracking in your desktop of... Right, so if you use billing, you can say, when did I enter bills, how much were they for, and have I been paid yet or not. If you use quick bill, Accounts receivable knows that you did a bill, but job costs and contracts don't know that you did a bill. <coughs> so if you want your project managers to manage revenue and, a, and AR, you need to use billing. Because otherwise, the stuff the project managers see won't tell them what's going on on that side. And it's not that hard to use. <coughs> okay, so we went into job setup. I opened up the job we had already created. So job, sorry, job central. Mm -hmm. So job central, the first screen looks just like our job cost job setup screen, which is what it is. This is the information that gets put into job costs. The second screen is the accounting information that gets put into job costs. Uh, the third screen is the AR customer, which actually goes into job costs and into contracts. And then the, whether it's quick bill or contract based, this is, this checkbox ends up in job costs. The, retain, the retention and what invoice format to print on ends up in contracts. 
So by being in Job Central, we're, we're putting some information into job cost and some information into contracts, all from the same screen. No, if you click this box that says, I'm going to do quick bill, you're saying, I don't want to let myself do contracts. If, the, if you click the box that says, I'm going to do contract billing, it gives you the option of setting up a contract or of doing a quick bill. So that's why I say you should set your default and job cost to always be contract based, because then you have the option of doing it either way down the road. If you say you're going to do quick bill, you can only do quick bill. So those jobs, you can still click the box that says this is a contract job and then never set up a contract right. and then use Quick Bill. Okay. All right, so by setting up um, the retention percentage and the, the invoice I want it to print on, I've started to set up con my contracts. And now I can set up my schedule values. Again, however many line items you need, <coughs> you can set up those line items. Job Central also has the ability to enter estimates, um, although it is not necessarily easier to do it here um, versus doing it the other way. Schedule values is definitely easier to do it here, which is why I'm showing it. Um, but you do have the ability to come in here and you can add the extras. So if, if we want the project managers in the field to be doing the entire setup, um, they can do it through Job Central to create the extras and enter the estimate from here. Um, and then you just have a slightly different grid here where you have all your First you say what codes and categories you want, then it builds this grid where you enter your units. You know, and so this is where you'd say, you know, in this cost code I have 50 hours at 40 bucks an hour. Or if you're tracking your labor that way, you can say hours and rates. Um, and then it'll calculate the, the total dollars. And so when I say finish in Job Central, it's going to update the job information in job costs. It's going to update the estimate information in job costs. It's going to create the contract. So you can go back and change that. Then you have to go back to the estimates to update more information. It's like on the fly. Well, and I'm not sure I understand the question. Typically, you. You set up your estimate and then you're done messing with your estimate. Um, You can do it however you want. So you can open up Job Central and make your edits from Job Central. Or you can go to the Enter Estimate screen to affect the estimate, or go to the Contract screen to affect the contract. Um, yes. If you put it in the estimate, it'll automatically go to your contract to update everything. Um, not necessarily. So your estimate is your estimated costs. And so in the system, costs and price are always kept separate. So your estimate is w your estimate of what you think you're going to spend, so your estimated costs, and then you compare that to your actual costs. For T&M, you're eventually going to want to take that total and tell your customer, here's, what, here's my total costs, I want to bill for those. Um, but on a contract job, you can keep that totally, you know, say, you are paying me X dollars for this. Um, so that 
if all your stuff is TNM not to exceed, then you don't need to keep them separate. But in general, everywhere in the system you have numbers you, that you show to your customer, which are separate from the numbers that you track internally. Um, and since we were just talking about changing estimates, an important thing to know if you don't already is anything you enter in the enter estimate grid is additive. So if you enter 1500 and say, oh wait, it was supposed to be 1300. If you go back in and enter 1300, now it's 2800 because it added those two numbers. Uh, so you would need to enter minus 200 because that's the delta. So when you're looking at the blank grid, you think, oh, I want this number to be 1,300. It will put 1,300 in, but it, if it already has 1,500, it's going to add them together. And when you do the internal change, you just go into one of the categories and, and subtract out. If you, if the it's a cost code 100, you yep. take 200 away from cost code 100. Yeah. So now that we have the contract set up, it will let us go into the internal change. So we can do that now. took the long way around to get back to here. This is going to be making a change to what then? Uh, okay. You're moving money from one place to another. Yep. Okay. So, so this is the change request tool, which is for building a change order proposal to send to your customer. Um, and everything in PJ auto numbers, but I typically, um, if we're doing lots of internal changes, you probably want to have separate numbering. So I usually do an underscore and then INT for internal, and then this is 01 for my first one. And the reason I do that is because when you press new, it's going to look at whatever number was in there and add one to it. And so if I have a change request number one, next time I press new, it'll create change request number two. And so the putting an underscore means that it's always alphabetically higher in the lists. So I can manu manually manage my numbering for my internal stuff. Um, but then my, the requests I send to my customer will automatically be numbered. And some customers don't care. and you can get away with sending them request number three and then later request number seven and they won't say where's four, five, six. Some freak out and in that, so you want to use that underscore so that, that the numbering the customer sees will always be consistent. So we'll go through the change request in more detail in a little bit. Um, but basically there's a checkbox here to say internal so that will um, a lot of the reports when you print the log will you have the choice of to print everything or just the not internal. So if you want to print a list of changes to give to your customer, you would print the one that doesn't show all the internal stuff. So that checkbox controls that. Um, and then on this grid, we'd basically say, oh, we only have one code. I don't remember where I put the dollars. I'm gonna we looked at using Job Central as an option. Do we want to go look at billing quickly to finish the conversation on contracts? Or do we? And then we can go look at um, entering commitment, uh, entering purchasers or subcontracts through entering commitment. And changing them. Well, and then we'll get into change order management to do a change order to the customer to affect the schedule of values and a change order to the sub or supplier to affect the purchase order or subcontract. All right, so in billing. You can do the quick bill, or you can go to contract based since we've set up a contract. Yeah. 
And so we sent this up with three line items. So then you can come in every month and say, you know, this month I've done this much labor. I've done this much material. I've done this much equipment. And it will say, what, what percent complete are you? How much retention is going to get held? What's the total re retention held so far? Um, and if you want to say, hey, I'm 50% complete, you can type in 50% and it will do the math for you. Um, so you can either enter a dollars to bill and it will tell you percent complete, or you can enter percent complete and it will calculate dollars billed. Um, and then depending on which format we said we were going to use when we set up the contract, it will then print onto the invoice form. So you can print it to a piece of paper and hand that piece of paper to your customer. So this one is sort of the AIA style with the G702 cover sheet and the G703 backup. So you can, you can have it look however you need it to look, whatever your standard oh. format is. I think you're the first person I've ever heard who held the quick bill up as an ad the example of a pretty bill that you want everything else to look like. Right. And again, the advantage of doing it in the billing module is you're not in Excel, you're not in some other system. You're it's right. showing you your actual contract value and your actual build to date. But there are some types of formats, aren't there? Any, any, any? So um, we can look on your s system to see what you already have included. Some of the invoice formats I have on mine, you're not going to have. So if we say standard T and M. And you can set up what are called cost-based invoices, which will literally pull your costs out of the job cost side um, and then mark them up, which um, if you have a lot of crews doing a lot of small jobs, that's a great way to go. But it requires a huge amount of setup because you have to set up ahead of time every labor code that you're ever going to have in payroll and how much you're going to charge for it so that it shows up on your invoice with the correct dollar amount. Right. Um, and the, so that sort of bypasses the project manager to create your T&M billing based on your actual costs. The other way to do it is set it up as a contract job, even though it's T&M, have your project manager look at what your costs are and, and then choose what to bill, which kind of goes against everything else I said of not doing things twice, but I tend to lean towards doing the contract billing versus the cost billing because there's less setup and there's less risk of something not getting passed through and it keeps the project manager in the loop. So if I 
Give me all the contract bills. Well, the time consuming part is figuring out what you want the invoice to look like. And then once you save the template, you saw how quick it was to create a bill. I just said, click, 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 print. You know, so you can say, I want the bill to look like this instead of looking like the G702. So this isn't. This is based on you saying looking at your cost report and saying here's where I am in my job. For this month, here's how many dollars I'm going to bill my customer. So that bill is not automatically taking all your costs and creating a bill for it. It's billing the customer whatever dollar amount you tell it to. So it's you looking at your cost report and saying, here's how much I'm going to bill this month. Okay, so we said how much we want to bill from the payroll for like the labor hours? We'll still do our backup the same way, but we'll just have to do the same way. We bill weekly. We want to bill the labor that was involved that week, whatever invoices came in that week. I'm still wrapping my brain around it. <laughs> yeah, because what it cost me, I don't, I didn't, I mean, the material, yes. But labor, I don't care what it costs me. That, that's not the numbers I track. I track the numbers. It's just how many hours and what you can bill for. What I'm billing. Because when I do my okay. estimate, my profit and everything's in my estimate. You know, that's cost. I mean, that's uh, right. billable. That's what we're going to bill for. And that's what I'm tracking is my billable, out, my billable money, not my cost money. Which they might do. Okay. I don't know what they're going to, what, how they track out. But I'm saying, you know, it tells me my cost. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, and so I've done reports like that that I call sort of, um, I just lost the word. Um, it's not true cost based billing, but it's. Fake, fake is not a good word to use. But <laughs> <coughs> um, um, so if you know what labor codes you're going to use, we can set up the report to say, go look at these codes, see how many units were charged this week. Um, and we kind of have to set up the table. And this is where we might need to do a custom field that says, for this job, for this trade, here's how many dollars. We're charging the customer. We've got, we'll have on, a, on one job, we'll have 10 different pay rates, just 10 different billing rates. We would have to have a cost code for each one of them. And there's no way to do a cost. I mean, you can't cost code by every single one of them. Uh, Why? Not every welder makes the same money. The welders that make 17 and welders that make 38. So there you go, yeah. Into that setup question of if you wanted to spit it out for you at the end of the week, we have to think about ahead of time what are all the different codes we need and make sure they're, we store them somewhere.
Right, so we can do a report that gives you the information of last week, here's who worked on your job and here's how many hours they worked. Um, and then we can either choose to store somewhere what, their bil what the billing rate is for each classification so that it will automatically do that calculation or we can give you the list of people in hours and you can apply the billing rate for each person to figure out. This gets us back to the, should we be in Excel? <laughs> exactly. does that what we build and what we're billing and the money we got left to build. Right, so it, it's kind of a question of, do we know when we set up the job what the billing rate for each classification is? That yeah, we can enter it all. Oh, then we can change every year. So then we don't need a different cost code. We just need to make sure we have everybody appropriately classified in payroll. So they can all be charged to the same cost code, but we need to then go into payroll to see who charged to that code and what their classification was so that we know what to bill them out at. Okay. Did made to get you off topic or I, I just can't no. No, that's important. So, so maybe we do want to look at cost-based billing. If I'm not sure, because um, it's not a case of you saying, "Here's how much I want to bill." It's a case of what actually hit the books last week. Right. That's what I'm doing. Because if I don't use all the oh, good thing about the team and not to exceed. It's five thousand dollar bid. I only use three thousand of it. The other two sits there right. until I need it. Ten jobs from now, then we can go back and build it. <laughs> Keeps engineers from going to make change orders. 